Good afternoon, everybody. This is the June meeting of Progressive Legacy. And this afternoon we have as our guest, uh, Marise Morales, who's a candidate for council in District 4. We usually start with introductions. And so let's go around the horn and have people introduce themselves and say where they live, starting with Hank. Yes, I live in Wheaton, Maryland. I'm a member of the Progressive Legacy Silver Spring chapter. and. Uh, we have great capable people in our group and, we'll, and anyone who works with us will always be very successful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Barbara Stedwell. Hi, I'm also a member of Progressive Legacy and uh, appreciate knowing everybody and working with you all these past four or five years, I think it's been now. How long has it been? A long time. It's been a while. Yeah. Uh, anyway. Karen, are you ready? Introduce yourself, take yourself off of mute. Always important. She's on mute. Okay, I live in Leisure World in Silver Spring and I'm a member of the Democratic Club and the Legislative Advocates. Thanks for joining us. Rosie? Okay, I'm Rosie I, Ingman. I live in Leisure World and I have um, supported Marise in the past. And even though I don't live in her district, I know people that do and we'll see that they vote for her. Amen. Uh, Judy. <laughs> You're muted, Judy. I'm unmuting, and I'm not really Judy. I'm really Barb. <laughs> <laughs> but everyone knows me and knows I'm Barb. Including Marise. Um, I'm Barb again. I live in Leisure World. Mar Marise knows exactly who I am because she's been to my house. <laughs> um, and, um, I'm not a member of this group. I was invited to join in by Sandy Robinson this evening. I've been to a couple of your meetings. Um, I'm a member of the Democratic Club and also um, part of the advocacy committee of the Democratic Club. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me. You are, you're a member now. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, Sandy Robinson. Uh, hi, I'm Sandy Robinson. I also live in Leisure World. And I know Marise a very long time and I've been a supporter of hers and I think she's been to my home as well. <laughs> uh, and I'm also a member of the Democratic Club and Barbara's Advocacy Group. So that's Thank it. You. Betsy. Hello, I am Betsy and I'm also a member of the Leisure World Democratic Club. And uh, I know most of uh, these fine people and uh, that, that's this, yeah, let's see the African queen. <laughs> um, Pierre. Hi, everyone. Wonderful to see you as always. Wonderful to see Mary say, I've known you for so long. I keep bumping into you outside of the county, which is quite interesting. In court. And, <laughs> In court. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm really looking forward to your candidacy. I'm not in your district, but you know, I'm there to support you in any way that I can. Uh, so it, I, I really am looking forward to hearing from you because I would love to see you and um, see what you could do on the county council. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Marilyn. Uh, Rosamond, we're introducing Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Where is Rosamond? Here. Oh, hi. <laughs> How is everybody? We're doing fine. So without further ado, let's get into our program. Our special guest today is Marise Morales. Uh, she was elected to the Maryland House of Delegates in 2014 as the first Lat Latina to represent District 19 in Montgomery County. During her time in Annapolis, she sponsored legislation to reform the criminal justice system, protect immigrant communities, and protect workers' rights. She received the governor's award for her work and trafficking was recognized in 2019 as one of the top 100 most influential Latina leaders in the DC, Maryland and Virginia metropolitan area. Uh, Marise currently practices law in the greater Washington area focusing on immigration, criminal defense and personal injury law. And she's recently announced her candidacy for the Montgomery County Council in district four. So without further ado, let me introduce our friend, uh, Marise Morales. 
Thank you so much, Alan. Thank you. And it's so wonderful to be reunited with all of you, all my, my ladies, all my progressive fighters from Leisure World. And I, I believe I've been to every single one of your homes and um, you have fed me, you have fed my, my volunteers, you've door knocked with me. We have, um, we have done early voting together and just, you know, it's just so wonderful to see everybody again. And, you know, when you have kind of that public service bug, it's really difficult to shake it off. Um, and people will tell me, you know, well, Mayor say once you go into private practice and you start making some money, you may change your mind. And, um, oh, here I am. And, you know, and I'm just so, um, I feel honored and, and privileged to be in the position to be able to run again. Um, I believe that, I believe that we need people that really have the heart, uh, the grit um, and the compassion for, you know, the communities that we represent. And, and, um, and it's something that I just, my heart just, just beats faster when I'm doing something um, to help uh, the lives of other people improve. So I just wanna thank Alan um, and the Progressive Legacy Group for inviting me tonight. And um, that's, that's right, I announced my, my candidacy last, last week, actually, it's a, exactly a week ago. Um, we had 150 people and I know that Rosie was there. We had a couple of, of other folks from Leisure World. Um, and Leisure World, as you all know, is a powerhouse for Democrats. So, um, you know, and you may, hey, you may be redrawn into my district. I mean, that's still up in the air, right? Um, <laughs> um, but um, it's just been an honor to uh, have been able to work with you, represent you, um, and push for the things that, that matter to, you know, our District 19 folks. And then obviously now in the new role in District 4, um, for those, uh, for perhaps for those who uh, may not know a lot about me, um, when I was in District 4, I moved around a lot and uh, housing affordability is an issue that I've always been an advocate for um, and promoting first uh, first time home ownership or promoting home ownership to build generational wealth um, for our young families, our families of, of, of color um, and, and, you know, and just young people, um, because I believe that our communities, our, our seniors and our young people, we, are, we need each other. Um, we have, we have, you know, the younger generations, we need them to bring in the revenue so that they can pay for the healthcare and the services that, you know, that our seniors may need. And we, and we, we want to learn from our seniors and we want to make sure that our seniors are retiring here in Montgomery County. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of European models that have shown this. And I think, for example, programs like, uh, um, the villages that I know that Montgomery County under, uh, um, County Executive Ike Leggett. That was something that was very popular among a lot of our neighborhoods. And I, I hope to continue kind of promoting that. We understand also that our neighborhoods are looking to have pedestrian focused, um, walkable um, infrastructure so that our seniors and our children alike can walk without the fear of getting run over because of just the uh, reckless drivers that we have around. And, and I understand as well, you know, that these issues are complex. You have state roads, you have county roads. And I, I believe very humbly um, that with my experience in, at the state level, that we can harness those relationships. And, you know, and I always say, I've always said that the, one of my highest honors was to serve with Bonnie Collison and Ben Kramer um, your senator and your delegates. I did not have the honor to serve with, with Von Stewart or with Charlotte Crutchfield, but I know that they've been doing really great work as well. Um, so just a little bit about kind of, I, cause I asked Alan, you know, give me a little bit of a framework. What are folks, you know, looking to, to, to hear a little bit about? And I know that you all are as progressive as I am. I know that our hearts are all in the same place and just kind of the things that, um, that I was able to work on when I was in Annapolis. And then as I move forward, um, to the county level, you know, at the end of the day, at the core of our legislative um, priorities are the values that we have and the, the things that matter most to our families, um, our seniors, you know, women, um, hardworking families. So I'm going to start, and it's no particular order whatsoever, um, but just kind of in buckets of, 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 of things that I was able to kind of summarize for you all for today. Um, so one of the things that I noticed when I was in Annapolis was that unfortunately, there wasn't a platform 
for what we call the women's economic agenda. And the reason why was because the women's caucus, um, and I know that, um, I know that Barbara Levin knows this already because she spent a lot of time in Annapolis. Uh, the Women's Caucus is a bipartisan uh, group and anything that had to do with, you know, family leave, sick leave, pay equity, any of any any of these economic issues that are important to to our women, to our families and to our middle class and expanding the middle class just they were just written off. You know, it didn't really even, even make sense to bring it to the Women's Caucus because the Republican folks, just ladies, were just not having it. So I identified an opportunity. I wouldn't say a gap. I would say an opportunity. And I created the Women's Rally. And uh, actually, Bonnie always reminds me because I'm not really good at tooting my own horn. But this is important because um, we want leaders that can identify things that are needed and that are risk takers and that are willing to implement you know, programs that will serve the, the, the vulnerable, right? Some of the things that we were able to work on and pass um, are, are include uh, the pay equity bill, the Working Families Act. And again, and you know, your, 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 um, I know that we have some District 18 folks, District 19 folks, but you know, this gives credit to the whole Montgomery County delegation. Um, we didn't pass, but we worked on the fair scheduling bill um, we worked on uh, the expansion for protection of victims of, of extortion. Um, and this is important because we know that our, Montgomery County is a beautiful fabric of, you know, of um, individuals from all walks of life, immigrant as well. And so for, for folks that are undocumented, um, they continue to be exploited and in many ways extorted uh, to, the, to the point where employers will confiscate a passport until a job is done and even then um, they don't even actually um, follow through with pay. And that was something that we did with Senator Susan Lee. Um, and obviously you know, the sick leave uh, for companies with more, you know, 15 or more employees. Then going into women's health. Um, women's health, you know, I worked with NARAL on, on a number of these bills and Bonnie Collison, um, it, you know, expanding healthcare coverage for um, a year's worth of, of reproductive you know, of, um, of birth control. And um, I know that this, that this group may not be wondering about this, but these are kinds of things that empower women, right? And, and, and we believe that we should legislate with the values that we have. And that is uh, to make sure that, that there's equity also in healthcare, something as simple as that. One of the bills that I was very proud of, and this is, and this is for our seniors and for individuals who have long-term or maintenance prescription medicine, um, there were a number of bills that we were able to work together with Bonnie as well. Um, the synchronization of your of your prescription, so you know cholesterol or blood blood pressure, you know you have to you have to take it forever. So why not be able to synchronize it so you don't have to keep going every month? Um, now you can get up to ninety days of it, and for certain medicine you can get for up to six months. So that was that was that was a um, that was a great victory. Uh, moving on. Um, and this is Stephen Sename, for those of you who, who, who uh, remember Stephen, he's a pre the president of the District 19 Democratic Club, and actually my campaign chair now, um, he brought the issue of ADHD, and, you know, our generation, his generation, um, and he told, I will never forget this, he told a very heartfelt, personal story about how at the age of eight, he was prescribed Ritalin, and which he now ha has become dependent on. And he basically, you know, made it, and, and we got that bill passed. And I, I'm so proud of him for sharing this because it's going to affect so many children. The, what the bill does now is for, for children under the age of eight, if they are being um, diagnosed or if they're di diagnosed for any kind of attention deficit, the uh, physician or mental health practitioner has to let the parent know of behavioral tre treatment alternatives behavioral treatment of alternatives so that we're not just simply saying, okay, prescription medicine. Prescription medicine, it's, it's appropriate, that's great. Um, my, my, my sister is a psychiatric doctor, so I totally, I'm, I'm with it. But if there is a, a way that we can look for alternatives so that we don't condemn a, a child to a lifelong dependency on, on some of this prescription medicine, then I think that we've done, we've done our job. Um, beyond that, Gun control, um, you know, I, for those of you who, who may have not known, um, I sat on the Judiciary Committee uh, before I went to Health and Government Operations. So um, I, I had the honor to 
to work on bills with our congressman now, Jamie Raskin. At the time, he was a senator in, in, um, in judicial proceedings. So a lot of times the Montgomery County folks that were on the, on, um, the sister committees, so, so Jamie Raskin and Brian Frosch in, judici in judicial, and then uh, like David Moon and Will Smith and myself, um, in the House Judiciary Committee, we worked on a lot of these kind of gun control issues, including um, you know background checks and mental health screenings for 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 folks that want to register guns. And then we also, led by uh, Kathleen Dumay, we worked on issues um, surrounding the the rendering of of guns when it when it comes to domestic violence issues or you know or protective orders. So then moving on to kind of the I call it the tax or expanding our tax revenue, right? We want to be able to compete with DC and Arlington County when it comes to young professionals like me, um, because we want, we want to have, you know, we want to have their tax revenue. And, and what we see around the country is that people from my generation, they want to move into what we call kind of like cool cities. They wanna be able to, to live, work and play in the same space, in the same spaces. Um, and so why is that important? Obviously, and this also this is also tied to uh, first time home, home ownership or home ownership in general. And that was another bill that I was able to pass. Um, with home ownership comes civic engagement. And the data shows that my generation um, we're purchasing homes 10 years late, later than when our parents did in their lifetime. And so that also means that, um, you know, we're making, we're taking less risks, be it because of student debt or other competing responsibilities, taking care of our parents or perhaps, you know, whatever it is. Um, and so we cannot afford to have people moving into DC or Arlington, especially after we spend about $18,000 a year per pupil through MCPS. So if you ask me, we're already spending that much money on the, on, you know, throughout the K through 12 education. So we should be keeping that investment here. Otherwise it's, all, it's you know, we're, we're losing on that investment. Um, with that also um, comes incentivizing the entrepreneurial spirit. And um, I have become, since I last saw you ladies, um, I have become a, a small business owner myself. We're actually here at my solo practice and I have my, my paralegals in the next room. But one of the things that I noticed, and I'm an attorney, I mean, I'm, you know, I, I, I'm educated. I don't know how f folks have the wherewithal to find all of the different state agencies that you have to go to, to, you know, get your, your, small, your small business registered, you know, go to the comptroller's office to get your, you know, your, your payroll um, kickstarted all the different uh, property taxes that you need to pay, et cetera, et cetera. And with you know, the entrepreneurial spirit and innovation, that also speaks to making sure that we're you know, keeping young people and, and innovative folks here in the county instead of losing our investment because a lot, of, a lot of folks end up going to New York City or California. No, we went here, we want them here so that they can contribute to the tax base um, and we can, again, continue to support. It's, more, it's actually the opposite. We only want oh, a few people to be seen. We don't want the audience to be seen because we don't have releases. And then, you know, there are lawyers in there and the next thing you know. Okay. <laughs> that always happens. That, that, that always happens. Okay. So then, um, and then this, this takes me, I already mentioned the walkable communities um, and um, sorry, that threw me off a little bit, but that's okay. Um, we worked on, oh, right, we, child care is a huge issue. So uh, uh, under uh, Delegate Ariana Kelly's leadership, we worked on expanding child care subsidy. We, Maryland still scores really low um, in, in comparison to other states. So that's, there's, there's still a little bit more work to do there. Um, but, you know, we advance on that. Um, and then when it comes to just the environment and transportation, um, you know, I have 100% um, LCB score every single year. Uh, very proud of our work around funding the, the BRT and the Purple Line. Um, we worked on the moratorium on fracking that a, a lot of you ladies were actually the Annapolis. Um, you advocated for this, you lobbied everybody, you testified. I just, I just love you guys so much for all your activism. Um, um, but yeah, no, I think I've spoken enough. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Oh, of course. And then 
all of the work around our seniors um, under Ben Kramer's leadership, um, you know, we, we made sure that the attorney general had the ability to um, prosecute um, scammers and, and, and individuals who target our seniors. Um, and so that's something that the District 19 team, uh, we were always very proud to work on with um, our AG, Brian Frosch. But, but with that, I, I open any questions that you may have. Um, I have a lot of more notes, but but I'm happy. I would like for this to be more of a conversation than me just talking to you. Okay, <laughs> um, okay. I, I'd like to begin with, uh, I think very, very big issue is the environment. Yes. And one of the things that, that we have thought about, this is from Leisure World Green and other things, is, is there any way as a member of the county council that you could get the county to build a facility that will do um, composting. It, it's very costly upfront, but okay. in California, they, it turns into a money maker because they sell it to all the, the farms everywhere. Excellent. So that, that's a very, very important thing. Yes. I love that idea. Have you all, there's a, a large group in Up County, um, have you, have you guys talked about Because that would be a great constituency to kind of see how to collect. I agree. I think that you'd find yeah. people across the board. Yeah. And, uh, I just think that, you know, it's, it, it's very, very important that we have to think forward. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's, there's the, it's, it's called, the group, it's called the, the rural, what is it? The rural, and, and they, and they were just asking for speakers, but Rosie, I love that idea. Let's connect on that. And, and uh, okay. I think happy to look more into it. Sure. May I just make a point? Um, we were talking about um, scams on, on seniors. Yeah. This came in the mail today. They say we owe $113. Now I do the books. We don't owe anybody $113. Yeah. But if, but if we, we, we act right away, we can, we, can, we can pay it off with $74. Oh my God. I can imagine if you're if you're sort of a daughter like most people <laughs> after a certain age, this kind of thing scares the crap out of you. You know, how, how did I screw that one up? And then call them up and they have, you know, the noose that you put your neck into and they just say, We we got you now. And then, you know, it's it's a scam. Yeah. And my my mother-in-law was just asked, well, her um so not social security, her Medicare number was. And my wife has been spending hours on on tethering those people from her accounts. Yeah. And I think we have to really make this a priority in our aging yeah. population. Could you, could you could you email that to me, Henrik? Oh, I'm happy to provide you my email. Um, I want to know because th there was another scam that was going around, calling people, um, claiming that you had missed your jury your jury duty and that you had to pay two thousand dollars to the sheriff. Oh boy. You don't have to pay anything. <laughs> yeah, I get, so, I get social security uh, phone calls all the time where they're, they're going to attach my property and, I, and I'm, I call them up and they wish they never bothered calling me because I don't know <laughs> what they're doing. They're not supposed to call if they're having a problem. But I just right. wanted to insert that. Please, let's go on. Hank, what's the letterhead on that letter you got? Phoenix Financial. It's the made up thing. Oh yeah. Yeah. Hey, could we ask good. Betsy Katiti to speak? Mm -hmm. Will you tell her about the Nelson Mandela project, please? Oh, okay. 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 Nice to meet you, uh, Maurice. We have been for a while, actually going back to the Long legate, time. <laughs> the legate era. We have been trying to get public space named after uh, Nelson Mandela. Okay. You know, so that his legacy can live on and young people growing up can know who he was, all that he did to spend about 27 years in prison to fight apartheid in South Africa. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very important lesson that young people need to know about. So if there is anything that you think we can do to make that a reality and make it happen, please, please let us know. Sure. Is, there, is there a property or a, a space in mind that you all have? So Marisa, let me help you with this. Yeah. So the county policy is not to name any public space after somebody who's not connected with the county. Mm. Right. So, so we've gone to the county council and uh, 
you know, they're all supportive, but they haven't done anything yet. In the conversation we had last month with uh, Lorig Charcudian, we asked her to see if there were some state properties in yeah. Montgomery yeah. County yeah. that might be renamed mm -hmm. for uh, Nelson Mandela. But I have something which might be right in your alley, and I'm remiss because I did not share this with you before. Okay. Um, you're still on the board of Montgomery College? Yes, I am. So one of the things that we were interested in, there's a park in the Tacoma Park Silver Spring campus near the art building. Oh, yeah. um, and uh, I contacted Brad Stewart and he said, well, you know, there's some strict rules about that, but if a member of the board of trustees of Montgomery College uh, proposed a resolution, then the board of trustees together could vote to uh, name a particular piece of property um, for uh, somebody else. So uh, I would just commend that mention ah. that I think that's in your purview as a trustee of Montgomery College, that you could introduce a board resolution to uh, name some Montgomery College uh, space for Nelson Mandela. And we hope you'll follow up on that. I, that's a great idea, and actually, you you took the you took the words right out of my mouth because I know that College Park has pretty uh, di a pretty diverse um, list of names for different of the, the different buildings throughout the campus. So I, I don't see why that would be an issue. I would say though, um, as you know, Dr. Pollard has uh, has stepped down, and she is now at a uh, school out in Nevada, and so we're actually in the process of appointing the interim president. Um, so we are, we are kind of, you know, uh, working on that, um, but I'm happy to present it um, as we prepare for the next academic year. Um, and, you know, and I won't say if, I'll say when I make it to the finish line as, uh, uh, as a district four council member, I will have to step down because there's a conflict of interest, but I'm happy to, I'm happy to, get this ball rolling and talk to whoever I need to speak to to see how we can make it work. And yeah, please check with Brad Stewart because he's already had that conversation and seems to be pretty knowledgeable about that. Uh, moving on, Excellent. moving on as you uh, enter this campaign for uh, District 4, are there special areas that you're sharing with uh, constituents that would be your priority when you become a council member? Yes, absolutely. So right now we're just working off of the current the, the current map because that's the only thing that we can that we can work off of. Um, so I actually have the map right here, and my field team. It's obviously too small to show you all, but we have targeted the district um, based on voter turnout, and you'll see that just you know right around Leisure World and. Lay Hill Road and Plaza del Mercado, Aspen Hill, uh, Wheaton, Glenmont. We have a you know large large number of turnout there, and that was the heart. That was District 19. And all, you know that I mean I I know that those areas in and out. So I'm definitely going to go back to my constituents, but I definitely want to make sure that the folks kind of as you go north towards Howard that they also feel like they'll have access to me. And so and that's you know we never we never missed. We never missed a single meeting when it came to Olney and Sandy Springs space areas. Um, in that area, we we share with uh, the District Four, the the, the, the the District Fourteen delegation. Um, so, to the extent that you all have connections, you know, kind of going upward a little bit, like Olney, Sandy Spring, um, you know, happy to try to engage and identify folks to have little meet and greets. You know, now that it's a post-virtual, post-pandemic world, you know, some folks are still not comfortable meeting in person, and that's perfectly fine. So I'm going to be still door knocking my heart out, but for so the pockets of the neighbor of the neighborhoods where they're not, you know, they're not so comfortable having people, you know, show up at their at their doorstep, perhaps having little virtual um, meetings like this right now. Like it doesn't matter if it's you know if it's ten or fifteen people. The, the idea is to, to get the word out um, and so that folks know about my candidacy and that they know that my legislative style is to learn and hear from what the priorities mm -hmm. are from the different neighborhoods, right? And to be the best advocate 
um, for our District 4 residents. And so what I'm hearing though, just I'm sure you all have been having these conversations too, uh, what I'm hearing is that up here in like Laytonsville and only Sandy Spring, that may be broken off into a, a, a new district. Um, oh. hmm. Yeah. Uh, Marse, could I ask you about uh, are, are the the uh, Montgomery County Parks renting out their little spaces because that would be a solution. We yes. could do that. Absolutely. So uh, Montgomery County Parks they're opening up June twenty first. Sorry, sorry, June fourteenth. June fourteenth. Okay. And um, and I know that because uh, one of my uh, Monica Dame from the Aspen Hill Homeowners Associ Association she has been coordinating some of these for me. So I'm gonna have I'm gonna have at least you know, three events programmed in the next, in the next couple of weeks uh, mm -hmm. at the Aspen Hill Library. The Aspen Hill Library officially opens mm -hmm. April, uh, uh, June 14th. Mm -hmm. Then um, the Wheaton, uh, the Wheaton Regional Park, and then, and then Mid County, Mid County Queens Guard. So then maybe that, oh. yeah, and that's very close to, to, to you all. Yeah. Yeah. Well, see, people would be very safe outdoors. You, it doesn't, you know, you're not contagious. So that would a shelter would be yeah. um, fine to to. Uh, I love that. Own. Thank you, Rudy. No, that that makes a lot of sense. Marisa, does your district go out Ednor Road and up toward you know the road that goes up to Fulton, or don't you go up that high? Not not that high. Um, uh, it's it's and it's hard to show here, but um, you know how Ednor crosses New Hampshire and goes up. My daughter lives in that area. That's why I'm asking. Okay. Yeah. So it's, if it's on the Coles, is it on the Colesville side? That, I think that's district five that goes into um, Tom Hucker's district, but yeah. let's, let's connect. You can give me the address then. Um, yeah, I will. I yeah, will. We can. Thank, okay. you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So Marise, I was hoping that you could talk about some of your legislative priorities if you're elected to the to the council. Um, Nancy Navarro seems to have given lots of emphasis to development into Wheaton, to education, to pedestrian safety on Georgia Avenue. I wonder if you have uh, narrowed down things that you would like to concentrate on if you're elected to the council, maybe which committees you would like to serve on? Absolutely. Um, health and human services all the way. Um, that we've, we've seen from the lessons of the pandemic, um, you know, the vulnerabilities of so many communities. And I would, I would love nothing more uh, but to be on that committee. Um, and then I would say when it comes to just my track record on um, just, um, from the legal standpoint in our court system and you know and we, we, we that's what we hear from from our communities as well is that you know public safety has just different connotations depending on who you're talking to and we need to make sure that that all communities feel um that they can go to law enforcement that they can go to the court system and that they're going to be treated humanely and that they're their due, their due process rights are going to be taken care of um when it comes to what we're hearing from the neighborhoods, and I've been meeting with um, just the different civic association leadership. Um, Glenmont still, and it hurts me to the core, um, Glenmont still is, is an eyesore, and I lived right there. I mean, I, so I lived off of Lay Hill Road, then I lived um, off, so Kent Mill, the, the, Warwick, the Warwick building by university, and then I went and uh, moved behind um, Plaza de Mercado. So I've been talking to my former neighbors and, and the issues that still are coming up and what we're hearing is you know the disparate ownership issue um i think it's going to take and it's not because of any you know lack of willingness from the county council that's there now i know that it's been zoned to the max um it's really going to come down to just being creative bringing the disparate owners together and it's going to be a mix a mix of things between county investment so be it a, a parking structure that is uh, that you know that it's smart and it's um, aesthetically pleasing. And what I was thinking of, this is also again, creativity and working with the different um, relationships that I have as, as, a, as, a, as a board of trustee member from Montgomery College, I would love to see kind of like a, a quasi academic, quasi um, kind of workspace, um, uh, what, what do we call it? Uh, they're called um, like, like a entrepreneurial hub where 
in that shopping center, in that parking spaces, which is like, a, you, you all know, you know, you all know how Glenmont looks like right now. Creating a hub right there where it could be partly owned by Montgomery College, and then you could have individuals who, you know, want to open up a, you know, a small practice or some kind of, um, you know, innovative, um, any kind of innovative project, so they could have, they could have access to some of the, you know, the, the commerce right there. And then that would also contribute to the plan that is already under construction, which is on the other side of Lay Hill Road across the street from the from the Glenmont Metro Station. So Glenmont is one of my was one of my priorities. It's it's near and dear to my heart. Um, when it comes to all of the the walkable community planning, we understand that um, neighborhoods want um, dedicated bike lanes, and I I plan to continue working on that. Um, and also just you know and. I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but, you know, Veers Mill Road, we have, you know, we have been waiting for the construction um, of the uh, dedicated bus lanes, and we're just waiting for, for that ground opening. So when it comes to transit, when it comes to what our neighborhoods and our communities want, um, oh, is somebody, yeah. oh, sorry, um, those are the things that I'm going to be working on, and I, and I, and I feel, oh, you want to give them something made out of acrylic? This is acrylic. Can you, can you mute, your, mute your, yeah. mute your screen with the color? No. But I'm going with the color. It's going to scratch them. It's, it's not. It's going to scratch them. It's going to lose its shape. I've told you about acrylic. We need you to uh, mute your phones, please. Or no. Screens. Thank you. Okay, Mary. So, yeah, no. And the other things that we've been hearing from our... Um, from our, our families that have children in school. So um, I hear from the Kennedy High School precincts, that area, those neighborhoods, for whatever reason, um, our young ones are asking to be placed at the Einstein High School. And so to the extent that we can work with um, the Board of Education and MCPS to make sure that we're utilizing our schools to, to their, you know, to their um, full potential, I think, you know, that's a no brainer. Um, and that, that feeds into just the, the, um, just the, the, the environment that we have in those neighborhoods behind Glenmont and, and Randolph Road. And um, we want to make sure that, you know, that our schools are being utilized and that our, and that our children are uh, college ready. And again, so just obviously the county council doesn't have a say in the curriculum, et cetera, but to the extent that I can be an advocate for what I'm hearing from our constituents and work together, um, that, is, that is definitely a priority. And some of the things that I talked about earlier, um, uh, you know, continuing to um, invest in kind of, uh, you know, making the county a place where we can make sure that our seniors can retire safely and, uh, and, and you know, and, and stay in our communities and also attract young families and entrepreneurs to extend uh, the tax base um, you know, that's kind of the things that I want to make sure that folks, when they think about Marise, because we're all progressive, right? And so then one of the things that I, the feedback that I'm getting from the different democratic leader, leaders throughout the, the county that I've been working, that I've been talking to is, Marise, you know, how are you different? Because everybody says they're progressive and, and how are you different? And so then that's kind of the, what the message for, for those of you that are inspired to support my campaign. Um, I have a vision for the future where, like I said, where our, our seniors can retire and can age in place and, and that we continue to attract young people. We can't afford to lose young people to Arlington County or Fairfax County. We need to find ways to keep them here. And I can speak that firsthand because you know, I've become a homeowner, I've become a, a small business owner, and you know, our small businesses are the engines of our local economy. And I, and I believe that wholeheartedly. I think one of the things you might also say that you'd like to do is to put in more charging stations all around this area. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Good idea. Good. And I know that the, 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 the tax incentive, unfortunately, is no longer there. The tax credit um, for uh, hybrid cars and the Teslas, because I, I looked into that. So perhaps working with the delegation, that, that would be state level. Um, but yeah. Um, no, thank you. Thank you, Rosie. I think that that's a great idea. So, Marison, let me ask you this. Your uh, district, District 4 is one of, like 5 is one of the most diverse 
um, councilmatic districts in the county, as you mentioned at the outset with people from all over the world, speaking many, many different languages. How are you gonna reach out to um, Spanish speaking communities and to the immigrant African community and some of the diverse people who live in your neighborhood? Thank you, Alan. No, that, that's wonderful. That's a wonderful question. And um, I'm, I'm trilingual. Um, my, my husband is um, Martin, Martinique, like Francais, so he's French and his, so his father's from Martinique. His mom, and Martinique is a territory of France, like Puerto Rico is a territory of the U.S. And so at home, we actually speak in French. And, um, and one of the things that, that Nancy Navarro did really well, um, she recognized the, um, you know, the, the, just the, the beautiful diversity of our, of our communities. And one of the things that she led was the Latino Civic Project. And, um, you know, she was, she, she was able to, to, to find, a, you know, some space in the budget for some of uh, the media, you know, media and communication so that, you know, reaching to our communities in different languages takes more than um, a simple translation of, you know, of, of a document. You know, we, you, we, language goes further than that. Language speaks to our values, speaks to colloquialisms, um, just, just the different cultural aspects of, you know, what makes us who we are. And I think um, as, you know, some of the things that, you know, that, that, that I'm very proud to see that the council has done all together um, they created what, what's called the um, ra uh, racial justice and social, sorry, racial equity and social justice lens to all of the policies that, um, that are taken up by the county council. And uh, I really appreciate this question, Alan, because I don't really get to talk about this stuff a lot. And, and I know that the folks on this call, you, you all are just tremendous individuals with beautiful hearts. You are culturally aware, culturally sensitive, and that, you know, as our county goes in that direction, because we know that, you know, we are a majority BIPOC county and to reach, to reach families um, and, and parents that aren't traditionally at the table. And, um, and it, this isn't, you know, this isn't meant to be um, in any way critical. It's more so a way to identify an opportunity to, to, so that immigrant families and parents know that they're welcome. They're welcome to come and, and perhaps they, they can't make it to the civic association meetings or they can't make it to the PTA meetings. Let's find a way to come to them. And one of the things that I did when I was a delegate, I, um, I visited 75% of my schools. I tried to visit 100% of my schools, but I've run out of time. Um, and you know, one of the questions that I, that I often get um, was you know, my relationship with the teachers. And one of the things that I tell is my personal story. And that's an, I was, I, I, you know, I'm a former English as a second language learner. And what was heartbreaking to me is when I visited these schools and I spoke to these teachers and they're 24, 25 year old kids that are taking these jobs and God bless them. Um, they would tell me in tears, Delegate Morales, I can't sleep at night because my, my students are coming in with empty bellies I'm going into my own pocket to at least buy, you know, a granola bar or, or a snack in the middle of the day. Um, I don't have the wherewithal. I don't have the language acquisition um, training to be, for example, an ESOL teacher. And so these are the things that, you know, that, that when I visited the schools, they were telling me directly. And to Alan's point, if we want to make sure, if we want to ensure that all our children succeed, then we need to really prioritize this. And again, this is a, a board of ed issue, but I'm an ally, I'm a resource, and the future of this county depends on how well prepared all of our youth are. The quicker they can get out of ESOL, the quicker they learn English, and that's not rocket science, um, the quicker they're going to be prepared for advanced placement and, and, and have time to, you know, to, to study their SATs, to then go to college if that's what they choose to do or go to Montgomery College, which is a great institution. Um, and, and then now going, you know, with our, and we actually just, I would say like two weeks, two or three weeks ago, we voted to, to, to start the plans um, in East County, to have an East County campus for, um, for Montgomery College. So when it comes to language and understanding the differences from our, you know, the, the beautiful fabric of our county, um, it's about 
not just translating a document, but meeting our families where they are. Um, and right now, and I'll end with this, um, I'm just going all over our district four and beyond um, right now, meeting families for, you know, for a vaccination sites at a food distribution sites. And it's just, I mean, it's just so overwhel overwhelming to see the need, the need that these families have. And, you know, somehow there have been organic hubs of just human generosity and, and human ingenuity that they're, they're reaching, they're reaching the families, they're, re they're reaching the neighborhoods that for whatever reason, government hasn't been able to reach all this time. So let's, let's continue to empower those, you know, those kind of mm -hmm. informal uh, human connections that are happening throughout the county. I think, I think there's phenomenal um, talent, intelligence, and nat uh, national treasures right here in Montgomery County. And I believe that we can, you know, we can utilize that, um, you know, even at the county council level. May, may I say one thing though, I, they, I know that they've stopped um, the, the um, throwing people out of their homes. And our friend Dayu, who I don't think is on this, this uh, call, you know, you used to drive up uh, um, uh, Belle Pre and you'd see people's things out in the rain. And she told me that the district does not allow that. I think that would be a very good uh, little law to pass in, in Montgomery County. You do not evict when it's raining. You don't mind. I think that just makes sense to me. Yeah, it's cool so, enough to be evicted. I I I, I you know? I'm with you. The, the moratorium on the on the evictions. Um, yeah, no, that that was a, a really hot button issue. I can tell you, mm -hmm. and probably Alan and Marilyn, and if there are any other attorneys in the in, in the in the call, can also talk about this. You know, there the, so the the moratorium. You know, it did protect a lot of people, but at the end of the day. Um, from a legal perspective, I'm not. I'm not saying that I advocate that I'm advocating for this. I'm just saying, from a legal perspective, you're dealing. You know, it's it's a contract. It, it's a contract, and so when it comes to landlords and tenants, right. um, you know, and 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 our and our constitution protects this, right? It's a, it's the contract clause. You really can't go against, and and that's why this country is so beautiful because. You know, contracts. If two people have decided on something, that that's what it is. So the moratorium government can't go beyond. You know, can't go beyond that unless it's something unprecedented like a pandemic. But I, I hear you, Rosie, and I do believe that there is still an opportunity to make uh, a landlord tenant law a little bit more equitable. Not so, you know, not not so uh, pro landlord versus tenants. And yeah. I agree. Can I say something? I believe I believe in DC there's a law that when you evict someone, you cannot put their property out on the curb outside. They have, they bring your truck and they put it in storage so that their personal possessions do not get taken by whoever. Mm -hmm. I think that would be a wonderful thing to happen in Montgomery County. Yeah. It's sad enough and, and horrible enough that you, you cannot stay in your home, but at least their personal possessions could be protected. And I think that would be a wonderful bill yes. if we will get elected for us to do something. Yeah. That's a real human interest thing that we should be doing in French in Montgomery County. I'm used to it. Yeah. I like that. Free County as well. Thank you, mm -hmm. Barbara. No, I, that's excellent. That's yeah. Karen, go ahead. Karen. Um, I think that there are racial issues and this is of course nationwide, but Montgomery County is a microcosm of all the races that live in our country. There are a lot of uh, different cultures who don't understand each other. So we have Asians who think, you know, blacks are lazy and that's why they don't get ahead. They don't understand the history. You know, they have no idea. And you have Hispanics, you know, who have certain views of, Blacks or Asians, you know, we, I mean, you have Russians who have other, we have a big Russian community, you know, so we have all these cultures that don't understand each other and don't want to work together. And I think someone like you might want to look at that because it's, it's the scourge of our country, you know, that we can't understand each other. We blame things on the other. And I mean, white people are at the top of the list of, you know, doing all that. But 
we also have misunderstandings among all groups. And part of it is immigrants don't understand the history. And of course, white people tend to not understand the history either because they weren't taught it. <laughs> and, um, you know, we could be a, um, a, a shining star, you know, we could in this county because of what we have here and the high education level and, the, you know, the great mixture of people from all over, sure. that could be something that we really work on. And it also involves working with the schools, but it involves working with adults. Absolutely. And um, it, you know, when you talk about small businesses, if they're working against each other because of their cultural background, you know, and there's a whole, the, and, you know, there's a whole issue of, for elderly, of the home health workers, because they have all these same problems. The elderly don't want this group or that group to take care of them, you know, because they don't understand or they can't, they don't want that group because they can't understand them or they don't want this group because they don't like them, you know. So there are a whole lot of issues. And the person, a lot of times the person who's been hurt by it, who didn't get the job, doesn't even know why they didn't get the job. Mm -hmm. But we hear because they tell us, you know, our friends tell us, well, I didn't want that black person to work, you know. So it's a big issue. Mm -hmm. And it affects whether people can get a good job or not. So anyway, it might be something you, want, you could think about. No, It'd absolutely. Be wonderful if we could do something in this county. Well, what, I, what I've been seeing around the county are um, multicultural um, coalitions. Um, there's a coalition happening um, mostly in East County, and, and I've been helping out on some weekends, and it's a beautiful coalition of um, Indian Americans, Filipino Americans, La Latino Americans, um, Ethiopian Americans, Indonesian. I mean, it's if like, I, I totally agree with you, Karen, if it's gonna happen somewhere, it's gonna happen here in Montgomery County. And I think, yes, I, think. I think opening up our hearts, like what you just did and creating that opportunity, that platform, it's contagious, it's contagious. Cause at the end of the day, you know, we all just wanna be, we wanna be recognized for our humanity and we want to recognize everybody else for their humanity. And, um, and I think, you know, when you look at the generational differences as well, you know, there's more mixed race mixed race children everywhere. And that, yeah. that's, the, that's the beauty of it. You know, and my, my husband, my husband is one of them. And then, you know, and if, if we're blessed with children, then that will also happen. So um, thank you so much for putting that up. And, and I think one of the, the uh, you know, to speak to that, that was the spirit behind the, the racial justice and social equity, sorry, racial equity and social justice lens, because systemically, and I think this is what you were getting at, Karen, systemically, there are things that you know, we're not realizing how it disproportionately impacts one community over another. And that's because of lack of understanding, you know, of our history and, and redlining of certain communities and, you know, profiling of certain communities in terms of having access to loans, to be able to purchase a home, and then, you know, a, a delay in general, generational wealth and, and the generational wealth gap among certain communities. And I think, I think that as this becomes more of a mainstream conversation, and as people become more contagious, you know, as it becomes more contagious to to celebrate each other's humanity, then it's gonna, you know, it's no longer gonna be a, an uncomfortable. That's kind of that's kind of the, the future that I hope for. Yeah. Um, and I, I really commend this group for for really picking picking up these issues on these and, issues. I, and also on immigration, it feeds into immigration because you have people who are uh, even immigrants who don't want more immigration, mm -hmm. you know, like mm -hmm. I'm here and I don't want you to come in. I mean, if we can understand the culture and the humanity of everybody, we don't need to be afraid of people coming in, you know, who need to, to, to come here. So, I mean, I think it, it affects our ability to be, we should be helping with the immigration problem, you know, with the refugee problem. Yeah. Awesome. That yeah, I, I'm compelled to agree with Karen. I've uh, worked at uh, companies that had Hispanic uh, painters only, and then another another wing which was white painters only. 
and that they allowed that to happen was because the market would bear that they could charge more for the whites. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it's just self, it keeps things going in the wrong direction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we only have two minutes uh, left. Uh, Marise, would you like to make some concluding remarks? Absolutely. Well, to the extent that um, that I've inspired you today and um, that you have, I know that all of you are leaders and advocates in your own right. Um, I have a long road, road ahead. Um, you know that the primary is June 28th of 2022. Um, <laughs> and I will be I will be using public financing, so I won't be taking money from PACs or corporations. Um, and so I'm very happy that we have that program, at the, at, but at the same time, it's also, it's also very limiting. Um, and I wanna make sure that I'm crossing my T's and dotting my I's. Um, so you know, to the extent that you all can contribute or yourselves or a family member or, whatever, or et cetera, there's no low contribution in my book. The highest contribution is $250. And I do need 125 folks to qualify for public finance. Um, and you can join my campaign at marisaymorales.com. Um, and so, and money is not everything, you know, just having your wisdom, your advice, anything that you think that I should uh, be talking about or that should be a part of my platform, I am all ears. Um, and um, yeah, so I'll be, you know, looking to identify folks who would be willing to put together little meet and greets. Um, and then also I'm going to be putting, uh, setting aside some money so that during early voting, we can, um, we can charter some buses so that we can get some of our, uh, of our, um, you know, elder folks that are not at Leisure World, that are not, you know, that are in places where it's difficult to get to, et cetera, because I really truly believe that um, everybody should have, have access to vote and obviously, you know, it'll be post pandemic. So, um, but yeah, thank you so much for, for the opportunity to speak with you all today and, and I'll be seeing you on the campaign trail. Well, thank you so much thank you. Thank you. Alice, for uh, joining Progressive Legacy at our, our monthly meeting. We hope to meet with a lot of candidates over the course of the next year um, to talk about uh, developments in Montgomery County and around the state. Mm -hmm. so we'll be seeing you along the campaign trail and don't feel free to uh, feel free to reach out to us if we can help in some way. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of interest among the people on this call who wanted to talk to you and wanted to see you. So thank you for joining mm -hmm. us. Absolutely. Thank you for coming, Ellen. Can I make a suggestion? In the Absolutely. chat box, could Mara say put her her website and contact information? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Cool. Address. We'll, we'll Address. Email, email that information. Email that to us, please. Yeah, we're well, gonna bring this, we're gonna bring this to a close. We'll send that information around as an email. Excellent. Thank yeah, you. I mean, Thank nobody's you. gonna be copying the chat right now. So there you Thank go. you. Thank Mara you so much. Com, right? Yeah, or, but not everybody's gonna copy it, so please email it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. We're going to come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Nice meeting. Thank, Thank you, Marissa. Thank you very much. Take care, everybody. Bye, everybody. Right. Thanks, Alan. Bye. 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 Thank Bye. you, Ellen. Yes.